Good morning, folks. This is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Lecture 3 of Arrow 3261. Today we're going to take a baby step forward and we're going to look at stress concentrations for axial loads. Now remember when we're calculating stresses, even though the stress is just the force intensity, which is going to vary across the cross-section, normally what we're going to do is just assume that those stresses are constant and use the average stress P over A to evaluate those stresses. That's the way the allowables are developed and that's the way we're going to calculate our stresses. Today we're going to look at how to account for when that isn't sufficient. We're going to look at how to calculate what the actual peak stress is. Now mostly when we do this we're going to use that average stress that we already know how to calculate and we're going to make sure that we calculate the appropriate average stress on the net section. And then what we're going to do is use a factor, a simple factor, to evaluate what that peak stress is. We're really not going to calculate the detailed stress distribution in the part. That's too complicated, too fraught with errors, and too difficult for many students and professionals. And it's unnecessary complexity. What we're going to do instead is use that simple average stress and we're going to use factors that are developed either from like the theory of elasticity, higher methods, or from testing semi-empirical values to calculate what, how do we take that average stress and convert it to the peak stress so we can evaluate failure. It's actually a rather simple approach. That doesn't mean it's going to be necessarily completely easy. You're going to need to make sure you invest enough time to understand how this is done and how to find the appropriate factors, how to get the right average net stress, and how to get the appropriate factors so you can predict the correct peak stresses that you'll find in real aerospace structures. So let's get started. So we already saw that when we have a load on a member, we can calculate the stress. The stress that we're typically going to use is that average stress P over A and that assumes that the load has distributed itself evenly through the material. All we need to do is calculate the area of the section at the minimum section and divide the force by the area. Now for any of these sections shown here, A through E, this is very straightforward. And yet, all, each of these, the area, is fairly continuous. There's nothing interrupting, no holes interrupting the material. But if we have sections like these shown here, these sections here all have cutouts. Now the average stress is not just the stress P over A, where the A is no longer just that gross area, or the area of the part uh, as if there was no hole. We need to calculate the minimum section, which is the net area, which means we need to remove any cutouts due to holes or cutouts in the material or whatever. So in these sections, the lower A through E, we would have to remove this section and the appropriate section property would include that area of the net section rather than that gross section. This slide has a lot on it, but basically what it's saying is, if we were to load up a material, our assumption of P over A, that average stress being valid, is really only correct if you're sufficiently far from the loading. What happens is, right where that force is applied, you're getting a peak stress right underneath it. And as you move past that point, that stress will fan itself out. You could imagine that it fans out at 45 degrees. Imagine standing on your mother's bed. The bed does this. Right underneath you get the max deflection, the max stress right below. As you move away, you can see that load of your load is fanning out. And as you move away, you have less and less deflection. The same thing is true with materials. If you press on the material or pull on the material, it's going to deflect locally. But as you move down into the part, the further down you get, the more it's, so right where the load is applied, you get a lot of deflection. If you move down a little ways and look at that, that's got less de relative deflection. When you get down far enough, the whole thing deflects exactly the same. That means that load is fanned out. This text here on this slide and the little figures that are shown, it shows how 
under the load itself, you get a nonlinear stress distribution that's actually giving a very high peak stress right at the load application. But the further away you get, the more of the closer to the average you get. And if you get sufficiently far away, like about a part width away, which means that the load is spanning out about 45 degrees, that means you're going to get roughly that average stress that we're normally using. Got it? Now this does the same thing. This kind of is a fancy slide that basically shows how this load moves away. Moving from far away from the load, moving closer and closer to the load, you're going to find that we get a higher and higher peak. Now St. Venant is the guy who came along and said that these loads tend to even out if you get far away. And so we call this St. Venant's principle. So uh, another idea here, now this slide actually has a little bit too much text on it to be effective, but you can read this at your leisure in what I wrote in the handbook to get a better feel for how this works. What the, ba the main ideas we need to pull from this slide are that if you're far enough away from the load, you're going to get a nice average distribution of stress. Let's assume that we do have an average distribution of stress, but as we move through the material, if we find any kind of geometric interruption, like this little groove notch, which has an angle and a radius at the root that interrupts the stress lines, they're coming evenly through the part, and because of that, they have to move together. They tend to tighten up You'll notice that right near the middle of the part, the, the stress is near the middle of the part. The force lines through the middle of the part don't have to change very much. They just squeeze a little bit. But the force lines on the edge of the part have to move a long ways in, so they end up getting closer and closer together near the notch. That's one way of thinking about it. So what we end up finding is the little force lines are tighter, but not a whole lot tighter in the middle of the part. But the closer we get to the notch, the tighter those little force lines get. This is the idea of stress concentration. We find out a few things affect the stress concentration that occurs. The larger the angle of the notch, the lower the stress concentration. Also, the larger the radius of the notch, the lower the stress concentration. The sharper the notch is, and the sharper it is this way, the higher the stress concentration because it requires a more abrupt change. It's kind of like if you take a, a rod and you carefully sand it, you can imagine you're going to still get, you'll get a reduced strength, but you'll get a reasonable strength. But if you instead like take a hacksaw and sand through it like this, then actually that eccentricity of that and that sharpness will tend to fail that material a lot lower number. We'll study this more when we get into 3271. Right now, all we need to take away is how to calculate the peak stresses we might see. And this is called the study of stress concentrations. That idea that the stress is concentrating up at a value higher or lower than the average stress. And what we're mostly focused on is what that higher stress value is. Here's another little slide that goes and extends that discussion further. We're not going to need to understand this really deeply at this point, but if you read through this, you can learn a few things. This is showing how we get this peaking stress, and if we're down in the elastic range, so our stress strain curve, recall, looks like this, and if we're, if our modulus is, uh, as we increase our load, we've got this peaking of stress. You can kind of see the peaking that occurs in this figure just to the right of A. So we've got the part in section A here. In fact, I'm going to annotate this. You can see this part here is being loaded. And if we have, if we have a low stress applied, let's say 1,000 PSI, we're going to get a distribution of stress like this. And if we apply more stress, we're going to get a distribution like this. And as we apply more and more force, we're going to get a higher and higher stress. And this here, the value of the stress, that's the max stress. And that's the peak to value. We could say that that is the average stress, and we'll call it the net stress, which reminds us we have to take out any holes. We're taking a section cut and actually just calculating the area of whatever is there, times our stress concentration factor. We're going to call it K sub T. The K is our stress concentration factor, and the little sub T is not for tension. What that's drawing attention to is the idea that this is a theoretical value. 
okay? Some, there are many things that can cause the stress to peak more or less than this value, but this is a theoretical value that we'll often use. So if, we're take, if we have our stress strain curve and our materials like this, as long as the stressors down here at 20, 30, 40, 50 PSI, then the peak that we calculated with this KT times P net is valid. Now, as we get up into the plastic range, our modulus begins to drop, which means once we hit that, as we increase load, our load will get higher and higher, but actually right here where the stress is getting up into the plastic range, this little part of the material now will have a lower modulus. The other part has the original modulus. What that means is this part will not peak up as much. It will tend to flatten out like that. And if we increase the stress even more, even though the stress comes out, the next part will flatten out also until eventually everything flattens out. This says if we actually took this up to ultimate when your modulus is zero, what that means is the whole section now has a modulus of elasticity that's less than, actually it's close to zero, rather than being the 10 million of what we'd 10 MSI that we'd see for a typical aluminum, now the modulus is one MSI or maybe even less. In the extreme, we end up with a uniform distribution of stress where the peak stress is just our FTU or FCU. What this means is if we load up a, a structure and calculate our stress, P over A, if the max capability of the structure will be if we plug FTU into here, and say P max is equal to FTU times the area, the net area of the part. And if that happens, what we really have is an average stress distribution. That's the stress distribution we started with. But if we have a lower stress, let's say our stress is down below the yield, then actually we will not have this distribution of stress, this flat distribution of stress. We will instead have these peaking distributions of stress shown as the, in these two guys. And when that happens, what that means is the maximum stress is higher than the calculated net stress. Does that make sense? So this is how we're going to deal with these. Now, a lot of industry, uh, mechanicals especially, will just focus on what the peak stress is and write margins of safety against that. But as aerospace engineers, we need to be proficient in determining what's the maximum capability of the material so our aircraft and rockets are light and efficient and maximize uh, potential of the efficiency of what we want it to do. So this actually is not the easiest way to describe it. Basically, even though the stress concentration factor is, designed by, is defined as the maximum stress over the nominal stress, the way we're normally going to do it, we're going to say, okay, we're going to take our cross section, we're going to draw a cross section through the section like this guy shown here, and we're going to calculate what is the net area. Once we know the net area, we can calculate our net stress. It's just whatever the force is divided by the net area. Then we're going to go to an appropriate table and we're going to find out what is the theoretical stress concentration factor for the geometry of our part. Once we have that, we're going to calculate the max stress as the K sub T that we found times P net. That's the max stress and we will write our margin of safety against that. Does that make sense? So now that we know our basic approach, all we have to do is figure out what chart is effective. We're going to use the appendix of our handbook. It's appendix C. You can remember that because it's C stress con concentration starts with a C, so it's appendix C in our handbook. Let's say we have an axial load applied to a rectangular member. Let's say we have a flat plate like this one. got some thickness and it's got a hole in the middle. Well, if we look at that, if this is pulled in tension, we'd say, okay, it looks like this case shown here. All we need to do is find out what our width of the part is. They're using D for the width of the part. Okay. And what is this distance? We're assuming in this case, this case here, this figure only works if this hole is right in the center of the part. If that's true, let's say this is our radius 
which means the diameter of the hole is that, right? Then uh, all we do is we calculate what's our R. Our R is the radius of the hole. Our D is our width of the part. We can calculate this rate, this diameter over width dimension, come to wherever that is, and then we come up to our curve and we read whatever stress concentration factor it is. Now when we draw a cross section through this part, we see the part is going to look like this, where this is our thickness and this is our width D. So our area, our net area, is just D minus the diameter of that hole, which is 2R, right, times T. Our net stress is just the force divided by A net. Our max stress, oops, this is a stress, not a force. Our max stress is just the K that we got, which in this case was 2.2, times our P net. What's the margin of safety? Well, we'll go look up what's our FTU of the material, and then we'll write our margin of safety, FTU, divided by F max minus one. If that's zero or greater, then it's fine. If that's less than zero, it's not fine. and needs to be redesigned. Got that? Here's another one. Let's say we have a part like this. We're going to look and find what's our D dimension, what's our little D dimension. We're going to come in here and take what's the radius of this fillet. Now, a lot of times students get confused. Let's say that we have a part, and let's say that this D is 2 inches, and this D is 1 inch, and there's no information about the radius. In that case, we're going to assume that the radius is the full depth, which means that this radius then is just going to be D minus D over 2, right? Duh. Okay. Then what we're going to do is take the little R over D ratio and come up to the D over D ratio, whatever that is, and read whatever our stress concentration factor is. We'll calculate our F net, which means we're looking at the minimum section. If we take a cross section through here, our area is going to be dt. If we take it through here, our area is going to be dt, little dt. Which one's smaller? This one's smaller. So that's what we're going to use in our calculation for the max net stress. Then we calculate our max stress as simply k sub t times p net, and then evaluate that against the allowable. Does that make sense? The words for this net stress, we could say it's the actual stress. We could say it's the net stress. Sometimes we'll call it the far field stress if we're talking about continuous skin and there's really not set dimension. So we just say the far field stress is that value. We multiply these by k sub t. Okay. These charts are in your handbook. These are from Beer and Johnson. We are actually going to find for this kind of problem, we're going to have two different charts that we can use for these first two charts. Okay. Now, if you look in your handbook, uh, we already dealt with this case and we already, and you've got two cases. You've got case 0A, which is from Beer and Johnson, or you've got case 7A. Case 7A says this is the exact same problem. And these numbers should give you about the same number. What this means is your P nominal, what they're calling P nominal is actually your, your P net, your, uh, excuse me, what they're calling stress nominal is actually your net stress, right? So P over A, that's just the net area. And your stress concentration factor is just this little formula down here. That's a little simpler to use, and I recommend using that for your homework. Since this, you can just plug into your calculators and calculate it. Got it? If we have one with, now that other chart, the prior one was for a centrally located hole. If your hole is not located the center, center of the part, then you're going to have to use this chart A8, 8A. And then you'll put in this dimension C where that hole is located relative to the part. Now this should come up with the same number if you have a central hole, but you might as well use the other one. Now in this case, P nominal, just removing that area is not sufficient because what happens is you get a little moment that changes the stresses. So for this case, if we have a hole that's not central, 
P net is not sufficient. We need to use P nominal instead of P net. Just plug into this equation to get P nominal. Oh, one thing that's a little confusing about this, let me clarify it. You're going to want to mark your handbook accordingly. But this, you've got a term here, and you've got a term here. Okay? Make sure you don't booger that up. You calculate your nominal stress, and then you calculate your K sub T, and your max stress is just going to be K sub T times the stress nominal. Once again, you already know, we've said this before, stress is the same thing as stress. This is how most engineering programs define it. This is how a lot of aerospace folks define it. Either one works. You're going to see me using lowercase f a lot. Now, uh, you already saw this from Baron Johnson, and here is a similar one where we can just plug in our radius and our little h value and our d value with the part into this equation to get our k sub t. You see that? Now, if uh, you could also use this h over r ratio. Now you've got to take, okay. Now this says this is only valid when their L over D ratio meets this criteria. It kind of doesn't matter because this is the best information we use. So we're going to use this no matter what. But if it violates this criteria, we should probably report, you know what, this is probably more approximate than normal because we're violating this criteria. So what you're going to do to use this one, if we have this slide is, we'll go and say, okay, what's our H over R ratio? So you're going to calculate what this H is and what's your radius of this guy. If it falls in this range, you use these equations. If it falls in this range, you use these equations. Actually, anything less than two, we're just going to use these guys over here. Anything more than two, we're going to use this, even if we violate this. You'll calculate four constants, and you'll plug them into this equation to calculate your K sub T. In this case, our F net is our F nominal, which is just the area of this piece here, which is just D minus 2H times T, right? Excuse me, that's our area, our net area, so our net stress is just that. Our max stress is once again just K sub T times F net, and we evaluate the margin of safety against F T U if it's in compression of max minus 1. Got that? Is it starting to feel familiar? Here's another one. If we have two notches, we can use this. Two U notches. They have a radius and a little depth. If we have a V notch with an angle and an H, <coughs> we can use this. If we have a notch only on one side, you calculate your four constants and calculate your K sub T. If the notch happens to be semicircular, then you can use this lower equation instead. Once again, for this, your nominal stress is just the force divided by the net area. What's the net area? It's just this lowercase d times the thickness of the part. Let's say we have a plate that's semi-infinite in length. Semi-infinite means it's bigger than a few inches and we can't tell easily what the width is. If it has an elliptic hole, we'll calculate the stress. If it's a uniaxial stress, which means it's in one direction, then the stress A is appropriate. If it's a biaxial stress, which means we have sigma 1 and sigma 2, then we got the second set of equations. And if we have a biaxial stress where the stress 2 is equal to negative stress 1, we have another set of equations. Okay, These are giving you the peak stresses directly. So actually the stress concentration factor is already buried in these equations. If we have a rectangular hole like you see on some rockets and things, cutouts and thicker parts, you can calculate your four C values and plug into this equation your max stress is just the far field stress, which means the stress that's as if, if there were no hole at all, what's the stress in the part? Calculate that and multiply it by the stress concentration factor. It's a slight deviation from what we do when we're calculating the net stress.
If we have a bossed hole like this, you can use this. I don't think I've given you guys any problems like this, but these do occur in industry in some places. If we have a semi-infinite plate, like a skin of an aircraft, and we have dual loads, what this says is, if we have only sigma 1, sigma 2 is 0, which means the loading is in the same direction as the line of fasteners, then that's that first stress concentration factor. If the stress, concentra if the stress is 0 in the sigma 1, but something in sigma 2, which basically means the stress is pulling it apart, like two skins that are attached with a row of fasteners, then we use the second equation. Once again, we just plug in that far field stress, which basically means the stress without cutting, without removing those fasteners from the area is what we use for this. Okay, look at a couple example problems and conceptual ideas. If we have a part like this, we've got two methods to calculate it. We've got the Beer and Johnson curve and we've got our work solution from the appendix. See how that works? They're calling this the average stress. We're calling it the net stress. Both terms are used commonly. That's all I got for you. Make sure you study these concepts. Enjoy.